Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us and welcome. I am Lynn Krasker Schultz and I am the Director of Programming for the Vilna Show. We are thrilled to be welcoming all of our featured speakers today, Shira Springer, Gil Hovav, and Nida Degu Tiene. We would like to thank the Lithuanian Culture Institute and the General Consulate of Lithuania in New York and the Embassy of Lithuania in Israel, as without them, this event would certainly not be possible. For those watching, you are among over 400 people from all over the world turning into this program today. We have people from South Africa, Israel, Lithuania, Israel, Hungary, and of course the U.S. If you're unfamiliar with the Vilna, we are a Jewish cultural organization located in downtown Boston. We're housed in a newly renovated 102-year-old former synagogue building that was built from Jewish immigrants from none other than Vilnius, Lithuania. We were built back in 1919. Today, we focus on bringing people together through art, culture, and ideas. We invite you to join us on June 8th for an intimate virtual story hour that features stories from and about the Vilna show. We hope that this event about food, culture, and unexpected connections between the two is equal parts fun and thought-provoking. Who connects us in unique and unusual ways, and we look forward to exploring these connections during this particular conversation. Now, how today will work. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A box throughout the conversation. Don't put them in the comment box. They won't get asked if you put them in the comment or the chat box. We will be taking questions throughout the event, so feel free to pop your questions again into the Q&A box at any time. We also hope you will let us know what you think of this program by completing our audience survey. We'll put a link in the chat in just a few minutes. And please take just a moment to fill out these 10 quick questions. And now I'm thrilled and honored to welcome our host and moderator for this program, Shira Springer. Shira is a longtime journalist, BU professor, and all around Jewish foodie. Her full bio will be pasted into the chat momentarily. And Shira, the virtual mic is yours. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to the Vilna Shul for hosting this wonderful event about a topic I'm very passionate about, Jewish food. Also, another round of thank yous to the Lithuanian Culture Institute, the General Council of Lithuania in New York, and the Embassy of Lithuania in Israel. So first, I would like to introduce our panelists. We have Gil. Gil is an Israeli culture, culinary journalist and popular television personality. He was born in Jerusalem and currently lives in Tel Aviv with his partner and his daughter. His latest memoir, Candies from Heaven, was recently published in English. And now we have Nita. Nita is a writer, journalist, businesswoman, and popular food blogger. She grew up in Lithuania, then lived in Israel from 2009 to 2014 as the wife of the Lithuanian ambassador to Israel and South Africa. There, Nita quickly fell in love with Jewish food, culture, and traditions. And she also quickly learned that many of the dishes she enjoyed as a child in Lithuania actually derived from Jewish food. In 2014, she published her first cookbook, A Taste of Israel in Lithuanian, and it became a bestseller in Lithuania. She currently lives in Vilnius. So both of you, as we talked and prepared for this panel, we talked a lot about how food connects us and unites us. And sometimes it connects us uh, to each other. Sometimes it connects us to country. Sometimes it connects us to a memory, a place, and a time. So I want to start there with both of you. If you could, tell me about a food memory or a food that connects you to a certain place or time, um, a certain family member. Um, or family memory um, in your life. And why don't we start with you, Gil, and then we'll go to Nita. Gladly. Shalom, everybody. So I'm only a part Lithuanian. So I'm the great grandson of Eliezer ben Yehuda, who revived Hebrew, and he actually is Lithuanian. So I'm one eighth Lithuanian. But um, I have strong connections to Lithuanian food. This is not the food I grew up on, but I want to tell you a story about the bravery of Lithuanian food. So uh, we have good friends and the mother of my friend, who is already a quite elderly lady, always makes this wonderful, wonderful onion noodle kugel, which is Lithuanian. She is not Lithuanian, but she learned it from her mother-in-law, who was Lithuanian. And we always want her to bring it to Shabbat dinners, etc., because it's really something wonderful. And her grandson 
uh, went to study cookery at the CIA, at the Culinary Institute of America, and came back to Israel, you know, as a big chef, and of course opened a restaurant in Tel Aviv, and because it's in Tel Aviv, it's vegetarian, and it's all cement and glass and this and that, and white uh, tablecloth, etc. But he told his grandmother, you know, grandma, I want to have your onion kugel on my menu because I think it's the best dish in the world. But I have a crew and I've studied and we're going to improve it and we're not going to use, you know, powdered um, onion bouillon. We're going to use real onions and we're going to use this and we're going to use that. The grandma looked at him and said, you're not getting the recipe, you'll ruin it. It's a Lithuanian recipe. It should be the way it used to be. I don't want it to change. This is the food we eat and this is the food we love. And I respect this so much and I'm so happy she didn't give him the recipe because this way it stayed real. And this is what's so wonderful about Lithuanian food for me, that it's, it's really, it's connected to the soul and it's connected to whatever is real and there to stay. And this is why we love it so much. Shalom, shalom to everyone. Shalom, Gil, and to everyone from uh, from Lithuania, from Vilnius to Boston, New York, Johannesburg, Jerusalem. Everyone, it's really such a pleasure to be here. And uh, speaking about my memories, allow me to share. Uh, Gil, you said you are one eighth of Lithuanian. I am hundred percent of Lithuanian. I have nothing, no Jewishness in my blood. I, I, I'm not sure, by the way, but you know, but in my heart, I feel like I am Jewish. 100% the same as well. So it's very hard to distinguish my, um, I don't know, my personality to share, <laughs> to share my blood and my, and, my, and my soul. Allow me to share my memories from the, from the childhood. You know, I grew up um, in a small Lithuanian town, which is, which is named Druskininke. I know it's, it's weird names in Lithuania, so I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting you to pronounce it or to remember it, but it's a very popular health resort. And, um, uh, various people would come to this place from all over the world, all over the Soviet, former Soviet Union, and uh, many people who lived in that resort, they would rent parts of the houses, I mean, a couple of, of rooms from the, from, from the homes to the, to the vacation, vacationers, to the people who would come and to spend uh, three or four weeks. So basically, we would be sharing uh, the same flat, and also we would be sharing the same kitchen. And I do remember that we did have a lot of Jewish guests coming uh, and staying in our house. So um, we had to share obviously the, the kitchen and my mother used to whisper me to very, you know, very carefully to my ear. She said, you know what? Jews know how to cook. I know that Jewish food is extraordinary. It's very delicious. It's amazing. I do not know what does it mean. I do not know the recipes. Not I do not I do not know anything about Jewish food, but I know that this is very special. So I grow grew up with that notion and with that understanding that Jewish food is something amazing, mysterious, special, delicious, tasty, healthy, the best food in the world. But no one knew what is this Jewish food in fact was. So. Um, so I grew up basically without, um, without knowing what indeed the Jewish food was. But when I came to Israel as a spouse of Lithuanian ambassador, uh, the big part of me basically was also very happy because this was my opportunity to learn what it is that secret of the Jewish food and why it is considered, especially among Lithuanians, as very, very special. And um, well, I do not know how to how to name that uh, that that um, feeling when I was first time um, invited into Jewish home, and I saw entire table full of Lithuanian dishes. And it, initially, I thought that maybe this is you know this is the host who was nice enough to prepare all these dishes for me to enjoy Lithuanian cuisine. And I said, it's so nice of you, you know, to, to serve those Lithuanian dishes. But very deep in my heart, I was definitely, you know, hoping for, for some Jewish food. And suddenly I see those dishes, which, which we were eating at home, you know, the same ones. And she said, no, no, but those are not Lithuanian dishes. Those are Jewish dishes. And this is where I realized that Jewish food and Lithuanian food is so interconnected. And we have so many Jewish dishes 
on our Lithuanian tables. Just we didn't know that this is Jewish dishes. We, we consider them for, for, I don't know, for centuries that this is our dishes. And we enjoy them as our traditional dishes and we do enjoy until today. But I must admit, I didn't know that uh, it has a huge connection to Jewish cuisine. So this is why I feel so much connected. And this is perhaps why Israel was so dear to me and I felt so much at home since the first minute of, uh, of, of being in, in Israel and living in Tel Aviv, obviously. So Nina, you mentioned how there's great connectedness between Lithuanians and Jewish food even today. And I'm curious, what is that relationship? You know, how is Jewish food viewed in Lithuania today? I think we still lack uh, knowledge. We still lack understanding how many, uh, how, how, how big connection it is between our cuisines, between our, our culinaries. Uh, but we are we are now you know getting this information through all sources. Obviously, now people are traveling and uh, obviously they are discovering these things being in New York or in Tel Aviv. And of course, you know, for people, it's so unbelievable to to discover that, for instance, latkes, latkes, which is you know, say to Lithuanian that this is Jewish food. You know, they would be they would be definitely fighting for for their own territories because they say no, 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 we can give away anything, but not that one. <laughs> so, so you know what? It's it's I mean, it's it's quite a strange feeling, I think, for for many many people to understand that. Uh, Blintzes, Blintzes is Jewish food. You know what? I would, I would refuse to go to the to school every morning if my mother wouldn't make me Blintzes every single morning for twelve years of my school school time. So, I mean, it's it's so much in, interconnected. And now, Gil, I'm curious too. In Israel, what is the view on traditional Jewish food? I mean, you have Israeli food, but there's also the traditional Jewish food that we're talking about today. You know, bagels, lakas, chicken soup. Uh, Google, blintzes, what do people so, think? It's an interesting question because, you know, it's Eastern European Jewish food and Israel is not Eastern European anymore. So this food in the official Israeli cuisine is almost extinct. If you go to restaurants in Israel, you won't find these foods. If you go to homes, uh, on holidays, etc. Of course, it's there, and and we love it. But um, Israel has evolved, and Israel is a Middle Eastern country. The food we eat today is much more Arab, is much more Middle Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean. It, it's fresher, it's more colorful, and uh, we are wandering away from blintzes, latkes, etc. Having said that. We love it. We love it, but um, we don't eat it on a daily basis. So mostly holiday fare. Yeah. Okay. But also, uh, also, I would like to add that um, we had we had some friends visiting. Not only visiting, they they came actually to live in Lithuania for three years, and they worked in in uh, the in the embassy of uh, United States here in, in Lithuania. And before moving from uh, New York to to Vilna. This was a young couple. Their parents were very worried because they said, well, you know, guys, kids, how are you going to survive in this far away country where most probably Jewish food is, does not exist at all? Because, you know, I'm, I, I do not blame people that they do not know what we do eat here in Lithuania. And what a surprise was for those people when they came to Lithuania, when they arrived to Lithuania and they saw all Jewish holiday foods. Every, or available every day because we are not eating them on special occasions. It's available every single day. So you can celebrate any Jewish holiday every single day in Lithuania. <laughs> so uh, before we go on to our sort of the three food groups that both of you identified as kind of essential Jewish foods, I wanna remind the audience that they should send their questions into the Q&A box um, or you can put it in chat, but Q&A is easier for me to retrieve. Uh, we want this panel to be interactive. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts and your questions about Jewish food and its evolution. Um, and now we're going to head, though, to the, to the three food groups that, that Nina and Gil both thought were very representative of Jewish food. And we have bagels, latkes, and chicken soup. And we're going to start with bagels. And I think one of the things that, that I've heard from both Nina and Gil is how they've migrated around the world. And I'm wondering if both of you or one of you, which, whichever one you want, can give a little bit of perspective on how the bagel has sort of traveled 
around the world and change. And we have a little bit of show and tell as well. <laughs> may, may I perhaps have, because, yeah. because I, I yeah, prepared some facts. You have the largest variety too in your house. <laughs> he's the, he's the yeah. bagel expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, no one argues about this, the, the roots of bagel in Lithuania. At least we all recognize that this is uh, not Lithuanian, but Jewish food, but mostly because perhaps of the name. No one has any doubts that bagel be belongs to Jewish, the Jewish people of Lithuania or in the world. So let's start from that. The question if bagels uh, were founded in Lithuania is an open question because the first written sources about bagels are coming from Krakow, from Poland. But at that time, Poland and Lithuania was one country. So we can consider ourselves as part of, uh, of this bagel history. So uh, the first time when bagels were appeared in written sources was actually uh, in Jewish board of Krakow, and it was in very weird circumstances that bagels were uh, were, were uh, mentioned. First of all, it was uh, there were rules how bagels should be used in the Jewish society. Uh, why these rules had to be introduced? First of all, in order to advise Jewish families not to overspend on bagels, because bagels would be served uh, for for celebrating Brit, uh, the the you know the newborn baby boy. Uh, and uh, also another reason why there was a law on bagel. Uh, to make you know to, to to make serving so that less wealthy Jews, less wealthy neighbors wouldn't be envy, you know, of your you know showing off, right? And but bagels were also very well known in Lithuania, and it was a huge part of Lithuanian markets, traditional gatherings, uh, and even in, in the folklore of Lithuania, there is a saying that about the picky person. So so we say in Lithuania, you know, he picks like Gelumbovsky picks bagels. It's like you know, it's like 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 I say, we do not know who is Golombovsky, what does it mean? But that's that's how it sounds, right? Um, so many, as I say, many traditional markets in Lithuania were, especially in Vilna, were famous for bagels and people would come specifically to, to buy bagels. But the best bagels apparently used to come by river. They were brought by boats uh, from the villages which are currently in Belarus, you know, the borders in this area were moving back and forth. So, so nowadays these borders are different from, uh, from uh, what they were two or 300 years ago. Mainly in Vilna, there were two types of bagels, sweet and sour bagels. Uh, and after, after World War I, bagels were an essential food for, for toddlers and for babies. So they would put bagel to the to, to the cloth, and they would use it as a pacifier for the for the very small babies. And when the, for the toddlers, they would uh, they would mix bagels with milk, and this was basically the main food for for for, for the kids. But uh, bagels disappear from Lithuania together with the Jews who emigrated to United States and to South Africa. And for many years, bagels were in basically in those traditional bagels were inexistent in Lithuania. And here I visited today a couple of, you know, of um, bagel shops <laughs> in Vilna and I bought I, I bought some bagels. So bagels are back already from, Lithu from New York to Lithuania because bagels, New York made bagels um, famous, not, not Vilnius for sure. So those are very traditional bagels. This is beautiful bagel with the poppy seeds. This is with Herb de Provence. So as you can see, it's a lot of uh, selection. This is beautiful one with uh, linen seeds, with flax seeds. But in Soviet times, when, when we lived in Soviet times, we had this kind of bagels. I mean, they were not called bagels. They were called baranka, baranka, baronka, baranka. This was a very cheap food, um, which, could, which could, you know, stay for months, basically, you know, and whatever, it was tough, but it was chewy, always was good. Or even this kind of uh, small, tiny bagels. And those are, are very crispy, I mean, you can you can hear even you know how I can I can break them, and it's it's a very favorite food for for children. It's like a breadstick, but it was not called bagels. Bagels returned to Lithuania in the twenty first century only, and I think New York uh, guys came back to Lithuania to Vilnius and taught us back how to 
bake, you know, good bagels. And our bagels are available, fresh, beautiful in bakeries in Vilnius. So in Israel, the story is a bit different. You know, uh, in many cases, people from abroad, mainly from the US, have a wrong idea of what Israeli food is. You think of Jewish food, you think that Israelis eat bagels and cream cheese and, and salmon. We don't. It's an American thing. We, we, you don't have these bagels in Israel. No, you know, here and there in Tel Aviv, maybe, but the bagel I grew up on, I grew up in Jerusalem, is this creation. See how big it is? This is the Jerusalem bagel. I think it's, it's, it's basically Arab. And this is not the important part of the bagel. This is the important part of the bagel. It comes with a triangular pocket made from a newspaper filled with za'atar, and you dip it in za'atar. And for us, Jerusalemites, secular Jerusalemites, this was life. Because on Passover in the 60s and 70s, when I was growing up in Jerusalem, you couldn't find bread in Jerusalem, you know, only matzah. And who eats matzah? So you would walk to the old city and buy the Arab bagel and eat it. But if you, if you tell an Israeli a bagel, this is what he or she would think of, this big, big, big oval, semi-sweet pastry. Got it. Now we have something in the comments that say the best bagels come from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Are you guys familiar with the Montreal bagel? I, I am from Burlington, Vermont, oddly enough. So, and I, I have to think, kind of agree um, with the, the commenter that the best bagels might come from Montreal. When I was lecturing in Montreal, the first thing I was, you know, Usually when you go around the world lecturing, they want to show you the bay. Yeah, you go to Sydney, you must see our bay. You go there, you must see our bay. In Montreal, the first thing they tell you, the best bagels in the world are here in Montreal. We are the kings of bagels. So I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I haven't tasted, I guess, uh, bagels in Montreal, but I know that there is a bagel fights all over, especially in the United States. The most important thing which you have, which which a good bagel has to have, it has to make your your muscles of your face working. It has to be chewy enough, but you have to work hard. You have to really train your muscles. Otherwise, if it's too soft or you know too crispy, this is not the bagel. <laughs> we have we have another interesting question. I just that, that's actually about borscht that I wanted to throw out with you. And we're getting a lot of questions about sort of food origins and the kashrut and stuff like this, but it says, our family has two tradition, borscht made with meat and borscht made vegetarian. Uh, the two parts of the family argue about which is traditional originally. What can you add to that? Do you have any borscht experts? Yeah, well, well borscht is yet another Lithuanian food, which is, which is I mean, it's, uh, your life is unimaginable about, uh, without borscht because, you know, we have four seasons with very deep and long winter. So we are using those vegetables which can stay for, for longer. Uh, beetroots are one of the vegetables which grow easily in Lithuania and you can store them for six months easily in your cellar and use uh, for an entire year. So we have two types of borscht. First of all, we usually cook borscht as a soup the hot borscht with meat, but you know, it's, 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 it's obviously, you know, in, in my mother's, I would say, um, times or my grandmother's time, they wouldn't know such things as vegetarian diet. I mean, come on, you know, who would, uh, who would be picky about those things in the village, you would eat whatever is given to you. So obviously the soup must be with uh, meat. But in the summertime, when the, there was a hot weather, we would, you, we would uh, eat cold borscht, which is a, a very funny soup. I mean, funny for foreigners. It's very much loved by Lithuanians. It's a pink soup. And we, we uh, this is obviously without any meat because we mix uh, yogurt or kefir or, or, you know, like a sour, sour, sour milk with cooked or pickled beetroots. That's how we eat it with hot potatoes. And it's very refreshing. So we have two types of borscht for summer and for, for winter. In Israel, since we rarely have winter, our version of borscht would be the cold borscht. You can even buy it in, in cartons, like the milk cartons in the supermarket, and you, you add sour cream or yogurt. It looks 
not very appealing when you add it, I must say it floats like this, uh, but, uh, but yes, borscht with meat, we know of it, but it's very un-Israeli. It's, it's winter food, it's very hearty, it's very rich. It's not, it does not belong in our weather. Got it. Um, and I just wanted, for those wondering what Montreal bagels are, there was a, a good description I said, I, I found in uh, the Q&A, which is that they are baked in a wood burning oven and are described as often less stodgy and smaller. Um, the New York bagels and slightly sweet um, in case there were some people who were curious about what Montreal bagels yeah. tasted like. And, and on that sweet and sour um, sort of spectrum and getting back to bagels a little bit as these questions come in and with different food groups in mind, um, we have somebody, Tom and Deb, um, who wanna know how do the historical sweet and sour bagels compare with modern bagels? I think they were talking about the flavors that you were going through and the modern flavors I have here, the everything bagel. Um, but how do some of the, the sweet and sour bagels, I think, Mita, that you were talking about, compare with the flavors that you were showing us that you've picked up today? I think nowadays, uh, these sweet bagels, you know, th this, these, this kind of bagels you can get, I mean, they are not bagels, they are baranga. It's, it's not bagels. I mean, no one calls this bagel, but, but I think this derived from the original bagel. So those guys, you, it can be sweet covered with, you know, sugar powder and all sorts of that. But traditional bagel, I assume it's no, no longer sweet. I think the sweet bagel used to be part of, uh, of, these, of those markets uh, in uh, 200 years ago uh, happening, taking place in Vilnius. So I think for, for the kids, if you wanted to bring, you know, something, some, uh, some present from such a market, I think the sweet bagel would be something extraordinary and, and amazing gift. But uh, today you wouldn't uh, come across often the sweet bagel, I mean, you know, this kind of bagel, the traditional, traditional sort of, of, of the Jewish, of the Jewish bagel. Bill, anything to add on the sweet and sour front? No, we don't have it in Israel, so we don't, we, we don't really know. We, 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 we go to New York or Montreal or Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and maybe get your cinnamon and raisin bagel or something like, like that for your, for your sweet tooth. Um, I want to switch now to latkes. Um, and, you know, potato pancakes, Nina, are a very traditional Lithuanian food. And so I was curious, maybe I thought we'd start off with you telling us how Lithuanians make potato pancakes and how they're different. And then we'll, we'll transition, we'll move over to Israel. But I, as I understand, even the grating of the potato is different in Lithuania. No, wait a second. You know what? I, uh, I made an effort and I brought a thing which every Lithuanian family would have. This is an old, you know, it's, it's a new machine, but look at the design. It, it's the, such an old fashioned potato grating machine. You will not believe that this heavy, heavy, huge thing is for only one function, for only grating the potatoes. Can you believe it? I mean, you, you buy all these kitchen machines which are so multifunctional. This guy, this guy, you specifically buy it for grating potatoes. This is to prove that potato dishes and potato pancakes belong to Lithuania, for sure. And this is why we are, you know, we will be fighting for our rights, but not getting serious. <laughs> so um, here is another thing. I will show you how we make potatoes in Lithuania. We use this type of grater to grate potatoes, not that one. Because when you make latkes, usually you use this kind of great, this kind of way to grate potatoes. We use very, very um, uh, tiny, tiny holes and it's basically a puree. So this is how we make. Again, you know, um, depends on the season, if we are talking about the fresh potatoes or maybe after three years of uh, staying in your cellar, Potatoes can be watery and less watery, so we either add a little bit of, of flour or not, but usually our potatoes are have to be very crispy and we always eat potato potato pancakes. It have to be have to be very crispy, like you know, nearly deep fried. And we eat 
we serve them with the sour cream. Sour cream is yet another thing in Lithuania, which, you know, it has to be added on everything, including chicken, chicken soup for some people. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. I know it's weird. I know. But that's that's how, you know, that's how people in the village are eating. But potato pancakes, for sure, it has to be with sour cream, proper, you know, tough food. You go to sleep after this. <laughs> it's very heavy. And Gil, your, your luck experience? It's totally different. Um, so again, our latkes are already mixed with Arab traditions. So it's called rije, it's an Arab word, and it has lots of uh, fresh herbs in them, that, you know, coriander and parsley and dill and tarragon, you name it, whatever grows in your garden. It was the only dish my father claimed to know how to cook. He, he, he didn't know how to make coffee. Once he said, one day my father told my mother, you know, may I have some coffee? And my mother told him, you go and make coffee. He said, okay, I will. And he went into the kitchen and we were all silent because he never did. And then, you know, you could hear a weak voice asking, but how much sugar do I take in my coffee? <laughs> so this is his ability to cook. But one day he decided that he's going to make Rije, the, the, the sort of Yemenite Arab latkes. And he almost burned the house because he was waiting for the oil to, to, to bubble and, you know, oil just burns. So, you know, fire brigade and everything. But if you talk about the recipe, much spicier, no sour cream, garlic, onion, fresh herbs. Again, it's a Middle Eastern fare. So when you say much spicier, can you choose which spices you want in? Or is there a common blend? Or is it sort of each family, each region has their own? So spice? if you're Yemenite, you're using, you're using Hawaii. Hawaii is a spice mix. Haja in Arabic is a thing. So Hawaii is the plural. It's things. It's just a spice mix. And you know there, there are as many spice mixes as there are Yemenite families. But usually, if, if, it's, if it's just a common Israeli household, you would use uh, salt and lots of black pepper and maybe some cumin to give it, you know, some oomph. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's come up here also, I'm sorry, Nita, it looks like you might have something to say to add to that. Yes. Um, no, I just, I just wanted to say that, yes, indeed, that's, that's, that's the beauty of Israeli cuisine because, you know, they take those uh, traditional foods and they add something uh, and, uh, you know, totally different dish is uh, is served is being served because in Lithuanian cuisine and I know that in, in the Eastern European Jewish cuisine I think the biggest difference is only by the, the way we grate potatoes but we do not add any herbs and basically any spices just salt and, and pepper that's it um, some on, uh, onion and some garlic in, in some cases not even all, all everyone adds uh, garlic but but it's it's quite mild taste um, and definitely no you know chilies no Yemenite uh, Yemenite these heavy taste but I'm sure it must be so 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 delicious next time I'll try for sure. <laughs> I want to also ask about toppings because you know you were saying sour cream with everything in Lithuania including latkes but you know we have the sour cream applesauce debate are there any other toppings that are added on is this is there's a, an israeli topping that we're not aware of perhaps or some creativity there in israel you would either dip it in tahini or in tahini mixed with amba which is very popular right now amba is a sort of a relish made from mango and the fenugreek um tomato sauce schog which is the yemenite hot salsa so again, you would go to the hot spices. And, and it's very different from Lithuanian food, which is very mild and very uh, calm and tamed and cultured in a way. In Israel, you know, it's all in your face. Ah, you want color, you want taste, you want the uh, boom. <laughs> No, we sometimes serve, by the way, we sometimes serve also potato, potato pancakes with the cranberry sauce. Um, which is also, you know, sweet and sour, but again, it's very gentle. It's very, and I like it because I brought this idea of serving uh, potato pancakes, but, you know, if I show it to, uh, to other people, they look at me as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit crazy. So I put the sugar on, on top of it and I love this crispy sugar you know, on, on, on 
um, savory potato pancakes, which are with garlic, with uh, with onion, and you know, sugar doesn't go. I mean, like a normal thing on those things, but it's so delicious. I love it. By the way, any sweet potatoes? I know this is a thing in America where we have sweet potatoes. We have sweet potato latkes, so no sweet potatoes anywhere. No, if you if we are talking about Lithuanian traditional cuisine, no sweet potatoes, just regular potatoes. Of course, everyone since we have about two hundred sorts of potatoes, that's that's the vegetable which grows everywhere. Everyone has own, everyone has own favorite. Everyone knows the names. It's not like in Israel. You you go to the market and there are two sorts, uh, yellow and red. That's it. Two, it's easy. In Lithuania, oh my goodness, you have to you have to be an expert, and everyone claims that this is the best, you know, for that particular dish. I'm telling you, you wouldn't find the household without this uh, machine. So we better know our potatoes well, which dish, because we have, I don't know, 20, 30 perhaps dishes based on potatoes. So we are experts, like Israelis are experts on Middle Eastern, I would say, hosts or, or cooks are experts on uh, eggplants. We are experts on potatoes, for sure. <laughs> Eggplants and hummus, yes. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, yes. So if you're an expert, I have to ask you, what is the best potato for making latkes? Um, well, it shouldn't be, you know, again, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to name you the names, the, the names of this sort of potatoes, but it's very, it's, it's very much important to know which season our potatoes in, because in the, in the beginning of the season, they are very watery. So you definitely want to add some flour perhaps or some extra eggs to, in order to make them crispy. If I would be making potato pancakes now in this season from the previous year potatoes, because you know it's uh, the fresh, the new ones are not yet available, maybe some imported ones, but definitely not local ones. So they would be very, you know, very dry and uh, and uh, and totally different, different taste would be, uh, you know, would, would be resulting of of those last year's harvest potatoes. Again, you know, it's it's very it's very different indeed. I think. Most important features are starch and water, how juicy they are and how starchy they are. So we have some questions here coming in from the audience that I'm gonna throw out at you and before we get to the chicken soup portion of our, of our panel meal, so to speak. Um, it says, I've heard, this is from Irva, I've heard of the gefilte fish line, quote unquote, the gefilte fish line in Europe, foods north of the line, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, are generally savory or salty, and foods south of the line, Hungary, Ukraine, Balkans, are generally sweet. Is this line real? And I see both of you nodding, so either one of you, take it away. It is. I, 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 I have a publishing house, and I published a book uh, called Schmaltz by Schmiel Holland. He's a great connoisseur of Eastern European food, and he definitely talks about this line, and it's totally existent. Maybe if you travel to Europe, you can even see it. I don't know. I never tried, but it's there. 100%, 100%. When it comes to gefilte fish, as also to other Jewish food, other Litvak food, I would say, uh, or Eastern European food, it always, this is a distinctive, uh, distinctive tiny point. Lithuanian Jews, Lithuanian, you know, the Lithuanian Jewish cuisine is basically using a lot of uh, salt and pepper and Polish, and of course for the South, they are using also sugar, and that's how you distinguish between uh, those two cuisines. And I must admit, um, when it comes to gefilte fish, I love that you know sweetness in in uh, in, in the in the dish. <laughs> and and Gil, this is a question for you, and I hope I pronounced this correctly because it's sort of spelled phonetically here. But Zlata says, Gil, what about begali? with salt on the stick that were sold in kiosks. Yeah, begale. Uh, these are much, much, much tougher bagels. You really had to chew on them. They were smaller. They were this size. They still exist. Uh, the, the, a part of the bagel was dipped in uh, raw salt, in kosher salt, or in sesame. And um, they had a coating. I, I would assume that it was sugar syrup, but then they were baked. So they were sort of like the New York or the, of, or the North American bagels, but a poorer version, very, very, very dense. 
as a kid, this was when I would go to school, if I didn't take a sandwich, I would buy at the kiosk a bagel, but you could only consume it if you bought an orange juice or, or, or you know, Sprite or something like this, because otherwise it's, it takes an hour to chew it. So um, they still exist, but they're not the official begalach of Israel. Gotcha. And now we have a, a question about lakas and what do you fry in them in? What do you fry them in? What is your preferred oil um, or oil base uh, for frying lakas? I think I think when it comes to Lithuanian, very much traditional food, traditional latkes or potato pancakes fried, um, I would say by my grandmother, they would for sure use the pork fat, for sure, in, in the villages. Nowadays, when we fry, um, when we fry potato latkes, we usually use um, any vegetable oil, sunflower oil or rapeseed oil. That's, that's the, usual, the usual oil we use for, for this kind of things. Yeah, in Israel, I would say Jews, sunflower oil, Arabs, olive oil. Gotcha. Um, and we have a couple of questions. I'm just going to throw them out because people seem to be interested in this dichotomy of Lithuanian and Jewish food and what's what and what came first. So I'm just going to throw out a few. Um, it's, it's, it's a popular question topic. Um, is Kasha Varnish is, uh, considered Lithuanian or Jewish? Um, I know what it is. Um, definitely, for, sh for sure, uh, the name of this dish for sure is very much Jewish. It's not Lithuanian. It even it even sounds like a little bit of Slavic. Slavic kasha is, is very much Slavic. We do not we do not have this kind of word in in, in our vocabulary. Uh, so I think this this is uh, this 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 is Jewish food, not not Lithuanian. We might be perhaps uh, like kugel, for instance, like like kugel, which which was also named by mentioned by by Gil. We do have kugel, of course. It's it's totally we. We have the same name, but totally different food named by the same name. So if you if you order kugel in Lithuania, you will receive uh, grated potato kugel. I mean, with this machine, it will be grated raw potato and baked in the oven. So that's how our Lithuanian kugel looks. And there is no other options for that. If you go in Jerusalem to Be'a Sherim and you pop into some, I don't know, some, some shop, Jewish shop, and you want to buy kugel, you would get uh noodle noodle kugel with you know nicely baked and with with pepper with uh, sometimes sweet with cheese and with with various things same name totally totally different dishes okay and by the way what is what is the name for kugel what do they call kugel in lithuania what's the kugelis. name kugelis. Kugelis. <laughs> so it's somewhat similar same the same just you know we add lithuanian ending and that's it okay add Lith i like that um, let's move on now to chicken soup, our sort of third food category. And this seems to be the dish with the widest variety um, around. And so I'm curious, first of all, the different types of chicken soups you've come across is in Israel, elsewhere, Lithuanian. Um, tell me, we'll start with Gil. I know you have some interesting variations you've seen. So, so let's talk and describe some of them. So, so I'm half Yemenite and the chicken soup I grew up on is very popular in Israel, Yemenite chicken soup, which of course is made of beef. So <laughs> it's a chicken soup, but you add a big bone of beef to it to give it consistency. And then you spice it up with again, Hawaiian, which is, which is this spice mixture. And when you serve it, you serve it with a hilbe, which is the fenugreek seed salsa, which is very, very fragrant. And you know, there, it leaves none of the chicken flavor, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's a totally different dish, but it's a soup and it's very, very good. But the, the weirdest story I came across with chicken soup was, was when I, I bought a book called uh, The Whole World Eats Chicken Soup. And it deals with the fact that every nation has its own chicken soup. You know, nobody invented it. You, you had chicken, you had water, you boil chicken in water and you get chicken soup. And there in the book, there's an interview with Yasser Arafat who claims that the Jews stole chicken soup from the Palestinians because chicken soup is Palestinian. 
and he gives a recipe for a chicken soup, which is very similar to the Jewish chicken soup, but it's uh, spiced with a lot of fresh coriander. And he claims that this is the original. So who knows, you know, we can, we can no longer ask Yasser Arafat, maybe we should ask the chicken, but. Uh, I was gonna say, have you tried that chicken soup with the coriander, the cilantro? Yeah, it? yeah, it's very, you know, it's very, the taste is very local and very Israeli. And it's actually, you make your own chicken soup and you add lots of chopped coriander, uh, not during cooking, but while you serve it. And it's very good. It's very refreshing. It's very nice. It's yet another version of chicken soup. I wouldn't say that this is the original, but it's good. It's good, definitely. Excuse me, you bring up a question here. Like, what is the original? In your mind, what is the original? Is it just simply chicken and matzo balls? Is it chicken and noodles? I mean, what is the sort of, is there a, def, is there a definitive chicken soup? Do you have matzo balls in Lithuania, Nida? Um, not in Lithuanian cuisine, and I was going actually. I was I was going to add on on uh, on that chicken soup that I'm not sure if in Lithuanian cuisine chicken soup, as it is understood in Israeli life in Israeli mindset, you know for sure what you are getting when you are being served chicken soup. In Lithuania, any soup which contains chicken is chicken soup. I mean, it it does not it, it is not that. It is not that distinctive as uh, in Jewish life. When you come to Shabbat dinner and you are served chicken soup, you know exactly what you are receiving. It's it's a bowl, nice with the matzo ball or or with with knedlach or or you know or with some uh, some um, pasta. So so definitely in Lithuanian in in Lithuanian cuisine, I would say. You know, every every cook would be inventing own version of the chicken soup, which is which is not uh, widely spread as as the unique uh, as as I mean as the same recipe I would say. But I cook uh, my chicken soup. I cook according to the Jewish tradition, and this is how I I surprise my guests. By the way, because you know they think well, chicken soup they do not know what to expect because chicken soup I mean depends on the household what you are getting, and I serve the Jewish chicken soup, which I really make a good one, according to all the secrets, which I was, you know, which I knew that they exist when I was a child, but I had to come to Israel and to live and to ask all Jewish people to share with me those secrets. So now I know how to cook the, the, the proper chicken soup, which is considered as a penicillin, as, as a, you know, as a healing uh, substance. So I do remember when when my uncle was uh, sick and was in the hospital, you know, he he got COVID and I and I brought him, you know, I passed him a bowl of chicken soup and I, I said, you have to eat this. And he, and he was, you know, he didn't have such a good appetite, but when he tasted that chicken soup, he calls me and he says, this is not the chicken soup I was expecting. This is, this is really a, a remedy, a, you know, medicine. So I know now this is, I think, the Jewish, the Jewish true uh, chicken soup, which, which I'm very proud I know how to cook. <laughs> chicken soup by Pfizer, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Just curious, what is the, you know, you mentioned the feel of the cilantro in the chicken soup, but what is sort of the strangest variety, perhaps, or what are some of the stranger ingredients you've seen added to chicken soup where you've sort of looked at that version and said, oh, I never, I didn't see that one coming. I, I, uh, in Italy, in a Jewish restaurant, I had chicken soup with the roast eggplants in it. And it was very, very good. They, it added a smoky flavor to the chicken soup. Of course, in Chinese restaurant, they add a lot of um, ginger. Um, but Nida, was referring to chicken soup with the sour cream, which is really weird. Yeah, yeah but I, I think that's, that's only my brother who eats the chicken soup because he puts sour cream to everything and, and he prefers more sour cream than the soup because he hates soup. <laughs> so he prefers sour cream and a little bit of soup with that. I mean, because, because our mother would make him eat soup. So, you know, he would use this opportunity to eat more sour cream. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get more questions here um, from the audience. Um, here's an interesting one. And again, this is uh, sort of the cash root and, and Lithuania says, um, do Lithuanians tend to passively observe kashrut because of the Jewish influences of the past? 
So is there some separation of milk and meat? It doesn't seem like it now coming after, after your, your reveal that your brother put sour cream in his chicken soup. Um, but that's a question that sort of keeps coming up about the, the, the kosher mm -hmm. influences on Lithuanian cuisine. Um, no, I, I wouldn't, you know, I have this feeling that, it's, um, you know, I'm, of course I'm speaking about current day Lithuania because we had a, a really, you know, we, we had a long history of uh, coexisting with Jewish people in Lithuania for centuries. And then unfortunately we had Holocaust where we lost all our Jewish community. And for 50 years when uh, we were occupied by Soviet Union, we, we you know, it, I mean, you know, it was to expose your, your, you know, your traditions or your identity was, um, was not welcomed in that society. You had just to be, you know, gray uh, member of the, I don't know, Soviet people society, that's it. So, so we didn't have a chance perhaps to, to receive the knowledge and, you know, and, and the, and all those details and understand better our Jewish neighbors, which we did have, but you know, they most often would hide their identity. This was not common that we would, we would be sharing food. So we would be hearing the stories, you know, and we would know something about Jewishness, about the food and traditions. For 50 years, we, we were, you know, we, we didn't have this, this knowledge and, and this information coming to us. So now we are rediscovering this. And I think this is why Jewishness for us is now like, oh my goodness, it's, it's so, you know, it's so unique. And we, we are discovering things, how many things we have in common, you know, how many things we do not know, how many things we thought it's Lithuanian and suddenly we discover that this is Jewish you know, and we are, we are surprised, we are proud, we are happy, we are excited. We, you know, we, we love everything what is Jewish suddenly. You know, we love it. We are, we, you know, it's, we, we often joke that, you know, Jewishness is the most sexy thing in Lithuania currently, anything. I mean, anything related to Jewishness. So this is why we are very much, we are very much interested in, you know, in the traditions and what is kosher. Ask uh, Lithuanian what is kosher, they would have, million ideas but uh, i'm afraid none of those of those ideas would would make sense so no kosherness if you if you mean kosherness in lithuanian cuisine does not exist and uh, people maybe do know the basic thing that you you wouldn't mix milk and uh, and uh, uh, meat but you know they wouldn't come across idea that after having meat dish you couldn't eat, you, you couldn't drink coffee with your milk. I mean, this wouldn't make sense for many people because they think that maybe you cannot mix milk, you know, you cannot add uh, sour cream to your chicken soup. That's okay. That's what I mean, understandable. But, you know, other than that, not, I, I, I wouldn't, and, I wouldn't be no so sure. And no in pork fat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, people do not fry any more in pork fat because first of all, it's, you cannot get any pork fat. Another thing, you know, people are cautious about the health. So they are using a lot of olive oil and all, all other fats. But uh, if you think of, I don't know, my, my grandmother's uh, cuisine and kitchen and their life 100 years ago, then yes, of course, you know, that was, that was the, only, the only available, I would say, mean and, and ingredient. Yeah, I find it fascinating how much Lithuania and Lithuanians are embracing Jewish food and fascinated by it. And then you have sort of the opposite, not happening in Israel, but sort of this, okay, it's, it's for our holidays. We, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not the hip, cool food, whereas it seems like it's kind of has a, as a hip, cool factor these days in Lithuania. 100%, 100%. I mean, if you want to, if you want to be popular, just, you know, just drop a, a name, you know, Jewish something, you know, it's like, it, 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 adds, it adds on the value. <laughs> I mean, it, everyone is excited about anything what is Jewish. I want to come back to this, how popular Jewish food is in Lithuania and sort of the future of Jewish food, but also take a little time now, um, a couple questions here. Um, e. Klein asks, any insights on knishes? Any information on the evolution of knishes? Are they Lithuanian? Are there, there, there are Lithuanian types of knishes? Are, are knishes popular in Israel? Are they, you know, can you find a good knishin? Or where do you find a good knishin in Israel? So they're looking for insights on knishes. Unfortunately, you don't find them in Israel. 
and they're wonderful. I love knishes, but it's, it's maybe if you have the right aunt or grandmother, you're lucky enough to have it. It's unavailable in, in Israeli restaurants. You don't find, of course, frozen knishes in supermarkets. Or, it's, it's a dish that didn't get to Israel. It, 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 it traveled from Eastern Europe to the US and stopped there. It, did, it never got to Israel. It's, it's funny, it's interesting. I'm sure you could find it in, in Jewish houses uh, in Lithuania and maybe even in Lithuanian houses, they, they wouldn't be called the same name for sure, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that they would have the same, the same way of making the hepsa because you know what, those foods are so interconnected. When, when we speak about all those, those things, it's basically, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's the same. I mean, it's the same cuisine and who knows now how and where it was cooked or, or, or made first time and who borrowed what, but it's so much mixed in. And I think it's, it's, just, it's just so much of our identity. So, so I don't know, you know, you, you wouldn't find them perhaps in the supermarket. And what is also very interesting that we in Lithuania, we do not have any proper Jewish restaurant. I mean, especially in Vilnius, where where you know the the tourist traffic and and all the restaurant scene is is uh, huge, uh, and I think if there would have been even one nice restaurant of the kosher food, that kosherness, no one exactly knows what does it mean, but that would be adding so much you know excitement of on anyone because anyone would be having you know anyone would be interested in in tasting it, although. You know what's kosher? It's it's just certain certain rules and certain limitations in a way, right? But uh, so I think the same applies to all the Jewish dishes. We have maybe names named the different names, but we have those things in our everyday uh, cuisine, which which we do not consider it as a special thing. It's like you know that's what we eat. That's it. And. Uh, we have uh, Lawrence was curious about the prevalence of cilantro. You know, you talk about it in the chicken soup and you say it's sort of everywhere, but how, how prevalent is uh, cilantro, coriander leaves in, in modern Israeli cuisine? Is it very much? Fresh? It's everywhere. It's ever, first of all, it grows in your garden. And secondly, it's as popular as parsley. So, you know, you, you add whatever you have green and, uh, and it's wonderful, of course. It's very Middle Eastern and uh, it's, it, it, it belongs in, in our plate. It belongs in our terroir, it belongs in who we are. Okay, and now I wanna sort of, as we wrap up this, this panel, I have a couple more questions and this is now getting to the future of Jewish food. And I think, you know, one of the things is that Jewish food evokes nostalgia and tradition. So I'm curious, what do you think lies ahead in Israel for Jewish food and in Lithuania for Jewish food? What does what the future in, in both countries look like? And Gil, do you wanna start with that and then we'll, we'll, we'll segue to Nita? I think that um, COVID really brought old stuff back in a nice way, we wanted to feel secure, we wanted to feel at home, we wanted to feel embraced. So people started cooking old recipes at home during lockdown, etc. So I would say that old recipes, not necessarily Eastern European, they may be North African, they may be from Iraq or Iran, etc., made a comeback and um, as we Israelis are, you know, it's always with a twist. It's always with, maybe we'll add some Ethiopian spice mix to it, or maybe we'll add some Russian things to it, etc., etc. And it's nice. And Israeli cuisine is evolving all the time. And uh, it does look back, but it looks to the future. So it's, 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 it's very interesting because of it, because you take old recipes and you make them more flexible and sexier, not necessarily more kosher, but sexier. Uh, I wonder, I wonder what the, the future of the mixed uh, Lithuanian Jewish cuisine is in Lithuania, Nida. Um, 
I am not sure if this traditional Lithuanian Jewish food would has would have such big potential as Israeli food would have because you know this Middle Eastern um, fusion, which is very much present in the Israeli food scene. Of course, you know you cannot you cannot I mean you cannot be excited about this when you visit and you cannot you cannot uh, skip on noticing that. So obviously, all these Middle Eastern foods, like you know, like zatar, like like uh, hummus, uh, you know, all all those all those really you know Israeli foods, they have a huge potential in Lithuania for sure. If we speak about Jewish, you know, traditional food in Lithuania, as as I said, you know, it's existent every day in Lithuania, every single day. We do not have to live and to wait for for the Jewish holiday to to have latkes or blintzes or, or, you know, other Jewish Lithuanian, well, do not know where to draw the line, <laughs> things or honey cake or, or, you know, all those things. We do not have to, to wait until Rosh Hashanah to eat honey cake. It's available all year round, especially when the, when the apples are available and they are available all year round in Lithuania. So again, you know, I'm not sure. I sometimes think if, um, if um, Litva, like, or Jewish food, the traditional Jewish food wouldn't be a disappointment for some people, for some Lithuanians, because they would come with expectations that they will get something and suddenly they see the same dishes which they eat every day. So, you know, they would, I'm, I'm afraid that that would be a little bit of a disappointment for them. Of course, they would learn how, how many things we do have in common. This I can warranty. But um, I'm not sure about the potential because, because I think people still have it as something which they have more expectations than, you know, to come into taste foods, which they have every day at their own homes. So the expectations are too high for Jewish food? I think, I think yes. I think yes. Everyone thinks that it's special because we grew up on, on those, on those uh, ideas that Jewish food is about something being special. And, you know, and then you see that this is the same what we basically eat, maybe on different fats, maybe, you know, without a sour cream and, you know, with something else. But, but when we speak about traditional foods, it's, it's very much the same. So, so not opening a Jewish food restaurant in Vilnius anytime soon. <laughs> I, I would, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of bagel shops now appearing. There are a lot of restaurants who, which are turning into the historical foods and, you know, discovering not only incorporating, I would say, some Jewish touches, some uh, some other cultural touches, because Vilna always and Lithuania was always a center for multicultural society. So, so we did have maybe we didn't we didn't have a chance to 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 enjoy this for fifty years of um, quite a gray scene in that regard during the Soviet occupation. But uh, it's very now common to look back to our roots and to rediscover things and to bring back on the table and maybe to, you know, with a twist, maybe, maybe, you know, with a different presentation. But yes, but if we speak about very traditional food, it's, it's the everyday food, I mean, which is not festive, which everyone, of course, expects when they go to the, to the restaurant. And Gil, no, no Jewish food restaurants opening in Israel anytime soon. The way we have Not, you know, some daughters here, yeah. you know, in New York City. Yeah, no, I, I must say that Eastern European food is again is not the hippest right now in Israel. <laughs> not that, of course, we dislike it, but uh, it doesn't have the sexy aura that 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 Nida was referring to. We'll give it a decade and and check again. <laughs> There's always hope. Yeah. There's a long, long term, long term thing, um, potentially. Um, and with that, I want to thank both of you for joining us today. I want to thank all of the audience members and the Vilna Shul, um, and again, the Lithuanian Culture Institute, the General Council of Lithuania in New York, and the Embassy of Lithuania in Israel for being partners in this wonderful food panels. And I'm sure there will be information where people can find. There's a lot of requests for recipes. So I'll turn it with that, I'll turn it over back to Lynn.
Thank you, Shira. And thank you, Nita and Gil. What a fascinating conversation. I learned so much about the overlap of foods that I had never previously thought about. I feel like we could do a lightning round of name what this food is. Simis, gefilte fish, knishes, right? Whether it's Jewish, Lithuanian, or what it is, and we'd probably get a variety of answers. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, and gracing us with your knowledge for this conversation. For the audience, um, uh, please take a moment to complete the audience survey, which has been pasted a few times into the chat, and I will paste it again in just a moment. And we invite everyone to join us to the Vilna's Virtual Story Hour on June 8th. There was a link posted in the chat as well, and we will repost that as well. We will follow up with a source sheet uh, later this week, and the recording will be on the Vilna's YouTube site tomorrow afternoon. Um, which is Monday, May 24th, for those of you who are not in the same time zone, um, in the later afternoon, um, I'd say after 3 p.m. tomorrow, just so we have time to process it. And without further ado, I want to thank our panelists and thank our audience and thank um, the Lithuanian Culture Institute and the Lithuanian Consul in New York and Israel. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Shalom, shalom. Bye, cheers.